everyone's ready, I might begin. And before we do that, I'd just like to acknowledge that we stand on Wurundjeri land. This land was never ceded. It always was and always will be the lands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, I take the opportunity to pay my respects to elders past and present and to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room. My name's Tierney and I am the senior manager here at the Sir Zaman Cohen Centre. On behalf of our director, Nyadon Nyon OAM, thank you all for coming. And in particular, I'd like to acknowledge Professor Lydia Sinners, Dean of Victoria Law School, Professor Colin Clark, Director of the Victorian Business Confucius Institute, David Thompson OAM, one of our adjunct fellows, uh, Catherine Chang, Vice President of the Asian Australian Lawyers Association, and Kelvin Ng, President of the Victorian Branch. And also we have Sheree Ong, Chair of the Asian Australian Foundation. Thank you all very, very much for coming. It is an honour and a privilege on behalf of Nyado to welcome you to our centre and to introduce you to our work. Um, and before I introduce William today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what the Sir Zaman Cohen Centre does. The Sir Zaman Cohen Centre is a research and impact centre at Victoria University. We work in the intersection of law and community with a focus on cultural diversity. You may have heard of us from our work in the legal sector. We deliver tailored professional development for lawyers, and an example of that is our Chinese Legal Executive Education Program, which builds connections between practicing Chinese lawyers and the Australian legal system. Currently, our legal project officers are developing CPD courses focused on addressing legal and ethical issues for lawyers working in multicultural Australia. And you'll see Rubina right there, who's one of our legal project officers. Thank you. That's Rubina running away. You may also have heard um, about our innovative programs that are designed to build capacity for diverse communities. Through COVID, we've delivered legal and governance training for um, faith-based community leaders. The program was called the Ripple Effect, and that is exactly what it did. It supported leaders to build capacity back in their communities. Finally, and on point for today, the centre plays an important public education function. It provides a platform to address issues that are central to the promotion of fairness, equity and inclusion in Australia. And it is in this context that I officially welcome you to the Lawyers as Changemakers series. The series runs over May, June and July, and it focuses on Australian lawyers and their contributions and influence in shaping society for good. Um, we hope that these stories provide inspiration to all of you in this room to uh, improve our communities now and into the future. To provide the opening address, I am honoured to introduce William Lai, OAMKC. William Lai signed the Victorian Bar Row on the 26th of May, 1988. He is one of His Majesty's Council. He is also admitted to practice law in all Australian jurisdictions. He founded the Asia-Pacific section in the Commercial Bar Association Association of Victoria to contribute to the Victorian Bar, and in 2010, he launched the inaugural Engaging the Asian Economies Law and Practice Conference at Bangkok Court, Supreme Court of Victoria. Additionally, he is a past national vice president and one of the founding members of the Asian Australian Lawyers Association, which promotes cultural diversity in the legal profession. William also chairs the William Marquette Scholarship Committee. William is a council member of, the, of Swinburne University of Technology and also serves on the national board of the, Australia, of the Order of Australia Association Limited. He has previously served as president of the Chinese Professional and Business Association. Along with his other roles, William is a Victorian Bar Advanced Mediator, a VCAT appointed mediator and an appointed arbitrator on the Foreign Arbitrators Panel of the Shanghai International Arbitration Center, the Arbitration Association of Brunei Jerusalem and the panel of arbitrators of the Czech Arbitration Centre. In 2017, William was awarded the Order of Australia Medal for his service to the law, business, and the promotion of cultural diversity. He is admitted to <coughs> practice law in all jurisdictions. Um, what I'll do now is I'll invite William to the lectern, and William, as you can see from this beautiful screen there, is going to be speaking about the trailblazing career of William Market. William, over to you, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Tianyi. Can I also uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which uh, we meet uh, and pay my own respects uh, to the elders past, present and those who are here with us today. Uh, it is important that we 
uh, recognize the great contribution that our First Nations people have made uh, for us all to enjoy this wonderful land. Uh, I am honored and really thrilled to be invited uh, here because it gives me an opportunity to uh, come back here and at least um, fulfill some of my adjunct uh, fellow role. Uh, but I am thrilled to be here to speak about the life and achievements uh, of William Arquette. Um, this is a series, a three-part series lecture, and I'm uh, very privileged to kick it off. Um, so the topic deals with lawyers as change maker. I want to just bring you back to um, November, 29 November 1902. In the leader newspaper, we get a glimpse of who Mr. Arquette was and how he was portrayed. So the headline is a Chinese barrister. And I quote, Mr. Arquette, who successfully qualified as a barrister and solicitor at the recent law examinations. Now, in those days, there was only one university, and that was Melbourne University, and was awarded the Supreme Court prize of 40 pounds. A coveted distinction is a full-blooded Chinese, clever young Chinese. That was how he was described. Only son of the late Ma Ket, an old and esteemed resident of the Wangaratta district. And that column goes on uh, to talk about other things. But in her own words, Toilan Arquette, the youngest daughter of William Arquette, said this, and I quote, my father, William Arquette, rose to prominence in the 1900s to 1930s as one of Melbourne's most talented and adroit barrister. They are her words. Breaking barriers and challenging prejudices. Mr. Arquette was certainly a pioneering Australian barrister of Chinese descent, becoming a true change maker as a lawyer. His pursuit of justice and a commitment to community service has carved the path for future generations of diverse lawyers to follow. In my presentation, I will provide a brief overview of Mr. Arquette's family background, his varied legal practice, his contributions to public service, and then highlight the characteristics or traits that solidified his reputation as a true change maker in the legal profession. So he was born on 20th June 1876 in Wangaretta. Just park that date aside uh, and remember that. According to his birth date, he falls under the zodiac sign of Gemini that is characterized by adaptability, versatility, and curiosity. While some may not place much stock in astrology, it can be a fascinating subject to explore. Gemini individuals are often described as sociable and communicative, with a natural gift of language and writing. And if you recall the symbol symbolized by the twins, so Gemini are also known for the, their duality, which can make them difficult to predict at times. Those born under this sign are believed to possess a range of traits, including versatility, adaptability, sociability, curiosity, intellect, and restlessness. However, Geminis can also be indecisive and superficial and may struggle with commitment. Whether or not we place credence in ast astrology, Mr. Arquette certainly had many of those traits. And he made history by becoming the first barrister of Chinese descent in Victoria and possibly Australia to practice at the independent bar. So imagine this, at the time of his birth, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, historical records 
Australia's population stood at about 1.9 million people, with Victoria having uh, account for just over 800,000 residents. By the time he joined the Victorian Bar, of which I'm also a member, he joined the Bar in 1904, Victoria's population had grown to over 1.2 million people, while Australia's population had grown to close to 3.9 odd million people. And this is back in 1900s, the early 1900s. It is worth noting that before 1892, the legal profession in colonial Victoria closely followed the established practices in England. The profession was divided into two distinct branches. First, the barristers, who specialized in advocacy and representation in courts having exclusive rights to appear in the superior courts. And second, the attorneys and solicitors who focus on legal documentation and consultation with clients. They were the two branches. But they were fused from 1st of January 1892, uh, where practitioners then are admitted as barristers and solicitors. Today, we are admitted as Australian lawyers. Um, but the practice of that distinct practice as barristers and solicitors as a separate body remain until today, certainly in Victoria and New South Wales. And other jurisdictions uh, are not so um, separated and they're more or less fused. Mr. Arquette's parents were Ma Ket and Hing Ung. Many Chinese who settled in the rural city of Wangaratta, like in many other parts of Victoria, were from southern China. So majority of those people from southern China came and they speak Cantonese. Uh, of course, they could speak Mandarin as well. They were lured here by the gold uh, in the neighboring gold fields. And Market, Mr. Market and his wife, however, established themselves as storekeepers uh, and tobacco growers. Um, they knew how to grow tobacco uh, in Wangaratta. They acquired land in the township and a house on Wilson Road where they raised their family of six daughters and a son. And he was the fifth. Um, so Mr. Arkad uh, grew up in Wangaratta. At the age of 36 years old, he married Gertrude Bullock. Um, she was born um, in Victoria. Now, this is a story that is being written about. Um, one of his daughters, you've heard me spoke about her, she passed away at the age of about 94, 95 um, in 2015. And an autobiography of William Arquette is uh, being put together uh, by um, Dr. Andrew Godwin, helping the family out. And what we learned is that um, William secretly courted Gertrude for about four years. Every Sunday after church, they would meet in the Studley Park Gardens. Um, he had given her a picture of himself, signed, Yours Sincerely. And it was a love that blossomed over four years secretly. And it took a long time before uh, William could announce that to her father. And it took a lot of persuasion, involving a lot of um, high-profile friends to get his permission. They both were blessed in having four children, two sons, William and Stanley, and two daughters, Milan and Toilan. William's uh, son was known as William Mark Kett, um, and he became a doctor. He was, in fact, um, superintendent of the Fairfield Infectious Diseases Hospital. Um, Milan Kett married a famous uh, musician, Len Williams, who ran the London Guitar School. And together, they, um, 
What they are famous for is um, they gave birth to the famous classical guitarist, John Williams. And then you had Stanley and Toylan. Stanley graduated in law, followed after his footsteps, and he finished his law degree at University of Melbourne in 1935. And that was a year before William Arquette sadly passed away. And unfortunately, tragically, he died uh, during World War II. So he was a man in his late 20s when he was killed in action. And then we had Toy Lan, who graduated uh, with a Bachelor of Arts in Honours in Sydney, you know, from Sydney University, uh, and she lived till her long age of 94 years old. And uh, her story, uh, and a lot of what we know today is either from what she has published or uh, words that she spoke of in various uh, forums. So that's the family. Large family. He had children, and there were some tragedies. In the late 1800s and certainly um, 1900s, there were really only a handful of lawyers of Asian or Chinese descent in Victoria. Edward James Vincent Ni Gan is one of them, a son of a Guangdong immigrant. Um, he was admitted before William Arquette. Um, he was born in Bendigo and a successful, um, his father was a successful entrepreneur. Edward performed very well in school and coming from a well-to-do family uh, as well, he joined the law firm Kennedy and Woodward as an article clerk, and he passed his um, article clerk two-year uh, course. Less is known of another individual of Chinese descent, Ling Ah Moi, who was educated at Scotch College. And he later completed his articles at Cleverdon and Wesley. William himself, was educated in Wangaratta High School, and he did his article clerkship course at a firm called Maddock Jameson and John uh, Maddock Johnson and Jameson, now known as Maddox. That firm was established in 1885 and still um, exists today. In New South Wales, there was also a man who was admitted uh, in 1895. His name was Otto King Singh, and he practiced for a few years and then went to Hong Kong. The first barrister of Chinese descent that we know of in New South Wales was a man called William Jang Singh Lee, spelled L-E-E. -E. Uh, he was the first in New South Wales, and he joined the bar in 1938. That was how long after William Arquette. And, and uh, William Lee, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to meet him, but he passed away in 2010. So these three Australians of Chinese descent in Victoria and some of the others, what did they have in common? They were well-educated. They seamlessly assimilated into Australian society. In addition to their... Chinese language skills. Yes, they all learned and were tutored in the Mandarin language. They pursued studies in Latin, Greek, or French. William Arquette studied all three. So imagine in Wangaratta State School, where do you get the people to teach and tutor you not only Mandarin, but Latin. We know how hard it is to learn Latin, Greek, and French. So they broaden their cultural and linguistic skills. Despite being born and raised in Australia, Mr. Arkad faced numerous challenges uh, as he practiced at a time when the Restrictive Immigration Act 1901 was just enacted. 
and came to force. And discrimination and prejudice were widespread in a highly conservative legal profession. However, Mr. Arquette did build a successful practice at the Victorian Bar. He was a very able advocate. He appeared on numerous occasions in the Superior Courts in Victoria, including the High Court of Australia, and was greatly regarded by, um, with great affection and warmth by uh, his colleagues. He was popular, greatly respected for his integrity and abilities. The earliest case I could find Mr. Arquette appearing in the law reports is a case called Reed Dobson Ex Parte Beath, Scheiss and Co. That was in 1904. Uh, it was heard over two days in October 1904. And William Arquette signed the bar roll a few months before that. It was a decision of the full court of Victoria comprised comprising of Chief Justice Madden, Justices Beckett and Hood. The case, um, uh, in that case, he was led by one H.G. Joseph, who had signed the bar roll only months before William Arquette. And Joseph had a roll number of 84, which, and, and William signed his bar roll on the 20th of June, 1904. Does that date ring a bell? It was his birthday. And he signed it, the roll number that he was allocated was number 88, which according to the Chinese numerology, of course, it would make him doubly lucky at 28 years old. So, so what do you think? Do you think he believed in astrology? Uh, zodiac sign as a Gemini. That case that he appeared in was an insolvency case um, under the Insolvency Act of 1810. And it dealt with the question of whether the instrument in question was a conveyance or assignment for the benefit of creditors generally which supported the act of insolvency. The majority answered yes. Mr. Arquette represented the debtor and the petitioning creditor was represented by Isaacs KC and L.S. Wolf. They won the case, but his first case that I could find, he was already appearing in the Court of Appeal opposed to a team of Silk and Junior. Not for the faint-hearted, but he was nevertheless courageous. Not long thereafter, not long thereafter, months later, tipped over into 1905. Mr. Arquette appeared in the High Court of Australia, led by W.T. Colham for the appellant in the case of R. Lick against Lehmert. And who was he opposed to? Leo Cousin. Leo F.B. Cousin, Sir Leo Cousin of that fame, and T.F. Power, who acted for Lehmert. Ayik was charged with an offence against uh, Section 7 of the Immigration Restriction Act. And he was convicted, convicted resulting in a 14-day imprisonment. He appealed to the, uh, against his conviction to the Court of General Sessions uh, under the provision of the Justices Act then. However, before the judge could hear the appeal, an objection was taken that the judge did not have jurisdiction to hear the matter and it ought to be heard in the High Court. And hence, he went to the High Court. And, and the matter, and the judge was represented as well in the High Court. And so, Ayik was um, seeking to obtain an order Nasai from the court, calling upon the judge to actually deal with um, the matter. Um, and the court then comprised of Chief Justice Griffith and Bart, uh, Justice Barton. They found in favour of Ayik, in other words, William I, and thus allowing him to um, pursue his uh, appeal in the Court of General Sessions. The last reported case that I could find is a 1935 case. Um, months, uh, nearly just a year or less before he passed away. It's a case called Inri Thompson, Thompson against Thompson. It was a will case before Justice Mann. 
um, where uh, Mr. Arquette appeared for the plaintiff who were the executors and trustees of a person called uh, Percy Thompson. It was his estate. Arthur Dean, subsequently Sir Arthur Dean, and also Chancellor, Justice of the Supreme Court and Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, appeared for the first defendant, Henry Arthur Winnerke, another famous person, a judge, um, governor, appeared for the second defendant, and Alice appeared for the third. So the originating summons was taken out by the executors and trustee of Percy Thompson Estate to address difficulties that arose due to transactions of Cecil Percy Thompson, who is one of the um, sons and a beneficiary under the will. And the case involved interpretation of a will that left the residuary estate on trust for the testator's son and daughters who would attain the age of 25. And the, the will further provided that any alienation of a son's share before it vested in possession would result in a forfeiture of that share. And so Cecil Thompson had reached the age of 25, but had not yet received his share when he executed a voluntary settlement that provided for the income arising from his share to be held in trust for himself for life and thereafter for his wife and children. He later then executed a deed of arrangement under the Commonwealth Bankruptcy uh, Act, which disposed of his entire estate for the benefit of his creditors. And so the court uh, held that his share of the residuary estate had already vested in possession by the time he executed the voluntary settlement. So his alienation of the share did not result in forfeiture. And additionally, the provision in the settlement for forfeiture in the event of alienation was void as against the trustee under the deed of arrangement. Complex stuff. Moving from insolvency to um, bankruptcy to will construction, these are just some of the cases that William Arquette dealt with. There are three examples I gave uh, in more than 30 reported superior court cases that Mr. Arquette appeared in, including at least 12 high court cases. And this is over his 32 years uh, practicing at the Victorian Bar until his untimely death on the 6th of August, 1936. So in the High Court, who did he appear before? Chief Justice Griffith, Justices Barton, O'Connor, Isaacs. Remember, he was opposed to Isaacs when Isaac was a King's Counsel. Um, Higgins, Knox, Gavin Duffy, Rich and Stark. In the Supreme Court of Victoria, he appeared before Chief Justices Abeckett, Madden, Acting Chief Justice Cusson, Justices Hood, Lowy, Scott, MacArthur and Mann. So Lowy and MacArthur, I'll speak a bit more just later, I'll come to that. William Arquette was either led by a king's council or a colleague who had been no more than four years or so his senior. He would lead other colleagues or peers sole council. His master, pupil master, so barristers, they train under a master, that was what it's called then, now we call them mentors, but his pupil master was Stuart MacArthur, later Sir Stuart MacArthur, uh, a justice of the Supreme Court. His master was a senior junior, later King's Counsel, and had led Mr. Arquette and was also opposed to Mr. Arquette. Guess who won? Twice, Mr. Arquette had this distinction of um, having a case that he beat his master. Mr. Arquette also appeared um, before Justice MacArthur. And in that case, Justice MacArthur dissented and was ultimately proved right in the High Court. He also led Charles Lowy, 
on at least two occasions. And here is a man who also became a justice of the Supreme Court and a chancellor of the University of Melbourne. He was led by Duffy KC twice and Owen Dixon KC. He also led other juniors. The law firms that briefed him included uh, Maddock uh, Jamison, McPherson Kelly, and Hall and Wilcox. Um, he had several cases where he, his opponent's instructing solicitor was Edward John de Guinness, the Crown Solicitor for Victoria. And on numerous occasions, um, Guinness would be the solicitor instructing his barrister. Never brief Arquette, but always on the other side, and also opposed to Sir Charles Powers, as he uh, then subsequently became um, the first Commonwealth Crown solicitor. So William had a very broad practice. His cases range from conducting trials, appeals, reviews, in commercial disputes, statutory construction, libel, police matters, insolvency, immigration laws, estoppel. I was fascinated um, that he was dealing with estoppel back in the early 1900s. Contracts, sale of goods, trust, wills, and so on. And often, he would be involved in cases involving construction of terms in statute that had just been um, enforced or, or promulgated. Sir Robert Menzies, in his book, The Measure of Years, said of Mr. Arquette, he was a sound lawyer and a good advocate. His bland oriental features gave nothing away. His keen sense of fun was concealed behind an almost in, immovable mask. Mr. Arquette's accomplishment certainly uh, left a lot of for us to look at in terms of his legal accomplishment. But it went beyond that. He was highly regarded in the Chinese community, serving as one of two delegates from the Chinese community to be invited to the opening of the Chinese National Parliament back in 1912 in Beijing. He also acted as Consul General for China in Melbourne from 1913 to 1914 and then in 1917. He co-founded and became president of the Australian Chinese Association, um, co-founder and president of the Nam Pun Sun Society, a committee member of the Melbourne C. Yap Society, and he was a founding member and grandmaster of the East Caulfield Masonic Lodge. During that period, of course, there were also other trailblazers, significant people that lived but not in Australia. There is uh, Dr. Wu Tingfang, who is the first um, barrister of Chinese descent to ever be admitted uh, to an English bar, to the Lincoln's Inn. And he was admitted in 1876. And then, of course, you have Dr. Wu Lian Ke, uh, reputed to be the founder of um, um, modern medicine in China, and said to have invented the mask that we all became very familiar with during COVID. And I can only imagine that these three gentlemen would have met somewhere in their travels, although no record exists at the moment that we can find, but it is a big world, but yet it is a small world, particularly in their common interests. Arquette was also um, keen with his wife on many other things. They had hobbies, they were keen music lovers and theater goers. Um, he was a cricket enthusiast, life member of the MCG. Uh, he attended horse racing and he was a keen punter. He also had influential relatives. His cousin was uh, Chok Hong Cheong, surname Cheong, a leading figure among Chinese Australian Christians and had accumulated great wealth through property investments. Mr. Cheong was a theological student with the Presbyterian Church of Victoria in the early 1870s. He was a Christian lay minister and church leader. And it's interesting to learn uh, that William Chinese name is actually Cheong Ma Shen. And, and 
because of the translation, it, um, it get mixed up. Um, but the account by his daughter uh, that I have read um, suggests that they had spent a lot of time at his cousin's home in Croydon uh, during the holidays. It, it is said by uh, Ian Welch in his PhD thesis, Alien Son, The Life and Times of Chok Hong Chong, that, and I quote, Mr. Arquette had an enormous range of contacts through his legal work and also through his support of horse racing and regularly entertain Europeans at his home. Men who were married to European women were a very small group within the total Chinese population of Victoria. Their wives usually wanted their children to be integrated into the dominant culture and almost always chose to live among their European neighbours and send their children to local churches, schools and other community facilities. There's no doubt that William lived the life to the fullest. A churchgoer uh, and, and um, a community person, all of that. So I want to just finalize this picture of this man by looking at his characteristics and trait. Mr. Arquette read, of course, with Sir Stuart MacArthur. He practiced from Selborne Chambers alongside famous colleagues such as Arthur Dean Robert Menzies, who became Prime Minister of Australia, Owen Dixon, James Tate, Ben Dunn. These colleagues were referred to by his daughter, Toilan Arquette, and I'm sure she would have met them in social contexts. They all had accolades. They were appointed King's Counsel, Justices of Supreme Court, High Court, Prime Minister, knighted. Um, Isabel Carter in her book, Woman in a Week, um, Joan uh, Rosenoff QC, um, a countess. Um, so Joan Rosenoff uh, is saying about um, William Arquette who spoke to her. A Melbourne barrister, Mr. Arquette, a friend of Mark, who is Joan's father, said to her, you and I have both chosen the wrong profession. Joan, we will never satisfy our ambitions. Neither of us will ever be made a judge. You because you are a woman, I because I'm Chinese. We should have done medicine. Now, gleaning from Mr. Arquette's own words, you might think he was resigned to his lot, including empathizing with a female colleague who was much later appointed a Queen's Council. Mr. Arquette certainly had the ambition and the talent, but unrequited in every way. Did his powerful friends, influential as they are, friends and colleagues not help him to advance? Was it so difficult a barrier that even his friends, who were either justices, king's counsel, prime minister, knights of the empire, could they not help him overcome? Despite these challenges, it did not stop Mr. Arquette from doing what he loved. So I want to just go through, before I finish, some characteristics and traits that we can glean from the writing of his daughter, Toilan Arquette. What are they? He was an accomplished and a trailblazer, an inspirational figure for diversity and inclusion in the legal profession. He was respected. He was a leader. He was dedicated, supportive, hardworking, and advocate for social justice. He was active in the Chinese community, capable, social, popular lawyer, skilled negotiator, reputed to be a settler of cases as well. Just think about it. He settled a lot of cases as much as he ran a lot of cases which are not reported and those that are reported is in the highest level. Some say he was clearly the Chinese rumpel of the Victorian Supreme Court. He had a keen sense of fun and humour. He was witty. That was said by Sir Robert Menzies. 
keen sen sense of funds. He was resilient in the face of prejudice. He was committed to self-development and improvement, to build bridges between West and East, and East and West. Um, he was multicultural. He had diplomacy. Uh, he had international vision perspective, really visionary in that sense. He founded uh, the George Ernest Morrison Memorial Lectures so as to bridge East and West. He had diversified interests, music, theater, passion about cricket, uh, punted once in a while, or maybe more than once in a while. So I would like to conclude my presentation by asking you to ponder about how you would have lived during Mr. Arquette's time. As an Australian-born Chinese of Chinese descent, would you have had the tenacity, grit, and courage that he did? How would you have responded in the face of a white Australia policy? Uh, how would you have picked yourself up faced, uh, facing all those obstacles? As an Australian born of English, Scottish, Irish, or European background, having the influence, status, power, being entitled, let's face it, they were. Those names that I spoke of, they were all men of caliber and some women who rose up later. How would you have used your power, status, influence to help someone that you recognize as a peer but who faces those obstacles? As an overseas-born Asian person, are you going to adopt the model minority, hardworking? Will you contribute to society or just accept your lot in life? So we can all play a part in mentoring, sponsoring and giving the opportunity to someone to even have that chance to succeed. The rest is, of course, up to them. In the words of Marion Wright Edelman, an American children rights activist, she said famous words, and I quote, you cannot be what you cannot see. Now, having heard just a snippet of the trailblazing life of William Arquette and seeing others who have also broken past barriers, I trust you can seek to become successful as Mr. Arquette was, as the future is what you see it to be. Thank you. William, thank you very, very much for an illuminating opening address. Um, now, you did end your presentation with a question, but we do have an opportunity for the audience to ask questions of you. Um, I'm just mindful of time, so we might just have maybe one or two questions from the audience. Um, if you just want to wave, Rubina will come by with a roving mic, with this roving mic, in fact. Thank you for that fascinating um, summary of William's life. Um, I wanted to ask, um, in your research about um, William Marquette's um, High Court appearances, which case did you find most interesting and why? Um, he was involved in um, the case that um, dealt with um, the weekend person uh, staying in a laundry, uh, laundry uh, laundromat um, and ironing his shirt. And I thought that was fascinating. I think that case might have been, just looking it up, um, it was a prosecution case, could be Bishop and Chong. And so you have the worker ironing his own shirt and he was charged for doing work. Uh, and I thought it was fascinating. And of course, uh, it boiled down to the question whether he was a worker and if he wasn't, but it went to the High Court. Uh, so little things like that, he stood up for. Another case I, was, uh, I found quite fascinating is the um, James Minahan case. Um, we, he was brought into that case, went to the High Court. Uh, it was about a person who, born in Australia, went over then to China at a very young age and lost all his ability to speak English and came back to Australia and they wouldn't let him in and they arrested him. Uh, it turns out that William was 
it is actually connected to James Menahan through marriage. So six degrees of separation. So here's a man who had a wide legal network, and he also looked after people through the connection, broadly well connected. So they are one of the things that it encourages me to think about um, not giving up, using what you've got to do well and to do better. Because we can either pick ourselves up or we can resign to our lot in life. William never did that. Um, and for a man who pursued his wife-to-be for four years, despite all those challenges, you know what sort of man he is. Tenacious, never give up. When he finds the soulmate and love of his life, he would do anything to win her over. Um, in that case, thank you very much, Catherine, for the question. And thank you again, William, for providing the opening address and on such an inspiration and influential character in the legal sector in Australia. Now, we do um, have a token of appreciation for you, William. Um, it is a uh, engraved medal with Sir Zalman Cohen's image on it to recognise... Um, Thank you so, so much for your contribution to Sir Zelman Cohen's vision of um, enhancing the legal sector's understanding of community issues and community understanding of the law. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.